Oh, I just drooled everywhere. Hello. Let's get into it. Do you ever think to yourself, gee, I am so awkward and cannot do anything correctly. You know what I need? A stuffy aristocrat telling me what to do and what not to do in just about every situation in life. Well, so did people of the past. Whilst perusing, I came across this book, Treatise on Etiquette and Dress. Oh boy, let me tell you, it's a wild ride. As a background on these types of books, Etiquette books were books that taught civility. They discussed social conduct, what the individual should and should not do in the society of others, with their golden age being back in the Renaissance. Basically think about that dinner scene from She's the Man, but historical. Shoot like you have a secret. I've gone through and marked off accurately and historically with these brightly colored pieces of paper. Pieces of paper. I thought I would share some of my favorite passages with you. This book covers just about everything, such as, but not limited to, entrance into society, introductions, salutations, social intercourse, conversation, visits, dinner parties and balls, street etiquette, riding and driving, traveling, etiquette of public places, courtship and marriage, table etiquette, hints on the improvement and display of female beauty. They thought of everything. Without further ado, gird your loins. We're about to take a trip. <clears throat> I'm kidding. I cannot see Garbo. And it makes me want to vomit. But darn it if they don't make me look intelligent. Does it magnify my eyes? I hope I look like that old man in that Pixar short. Introductions. The habit of saluting and shaking hands is now quite obsolete. At present, in the best society, all that a lady is called upon to do is to make a slight but gracious inclination of the head. A gentleman should raise his hat completely from his head and slightly incline the whole body. In bowing to women, it is not enough that you touch your hat, you must take it entirely off. Employ for that purpose the hand that is most distant from the person saluted, thus if you pass on the right side, use your right hand, and if on the left, use your left hand. If you wish to avoid the company of one that has been properly introduced, satisfy your own mind that your reasons are correct, and then let no inducement cause you to shrink from treating him with respect, at the same time shunning his company. No gentleman will thus be able to either blame or mistake you. <laughs> yeah, okay. The most familiar and affectionate form of salutation is the kiss. It needs scarcely be said that this is only proper on special occasions between special parties. Custom seems to give a kind of sanction to women kissing each other in public. But there is, nevertheless, a touch of vulgarity about it. And a lady of really delicate perceptions will avoid it. The conversation of those women who are not the most lavishly supplied with personal beauty will be of the most advantage of the young aspirant. Such persons will have cultivated their manners and conversation more than those who can rely upon their natural endowments. Some men make a point of talking commonplaces to all ladies alike, as if a woman could only be a trifler. Others, on the contrary, seem to forget in what respects the education of a lady differs from that of a gentleman, and commit the opposite error of conversing on topics with which ladies are seldom acquainted. Subjects to be avoided. In talking with ladies of ordinary education, avoid political, scientific, or commercial topics, and choose only subjects as are likely to be of interest to them. Talk to people of their own affairs. Remember that people take more interest in their own affairs than in anything else which you can name. Lead a mother to talk of her children, a young lady of her last ball, an author of his forthcoming book, or an artist of his exhibition picture. Having furnished the topic, you need only listen, and you are sure to be thought not only agreeable, but thoroughly sensible and well-informed. Remember that all slang is vulgar. Such habits cannot be too severely reprehended. It is a great mistake to suppose that slang is in any way a substitute for wit. There is no greater nuisance in society than a dull and persevering punster.
A well-bred lady of the present day is expected to know something of music besides merely playing a difficult piece. I need not say that no person of decency will be guilty of a double entendre. Still, as there are persons in the world possessing neither of these characteristics who will be guilty of them in the presence of people more respectable than themselves, a well-bred person always refuses to understand a phrase of doubtful meaning. Not the shadow of a smile should flit across the lips. Either complete silence should be preserved in return, or the words, I do not understand you, be spoken. A lady will always fail to hear what she should not hear, or having unmistakably heard, she will not understand. If you are a gentleman, never lower the intellectual standard of your conversation in addressing ladies. Pay them the compliment of seeming to consider <laughs> seeming to consider them capable of an equal understanding with gentlemen. You will no doubt be somewhat surprised to find in how many cases the supposition will be grounded on fact. When you come down to commonplace or small talk with an intelligent lady, one of two things is the consequence. She either recognizes the condescension and despises you, or else she accepts it as the highest intellectual effort of which you are capable and rates you accordingly. Get wrecked. Arriving too late. If you are too late, the evil is still greater and indeed almost without a remedy. Your delay spoils the dinner and destroys the appetite and temper of the guests. And you yourself are so much embarrassed that you commit a thousand errors at the table. If you do not reach the house until dinner is served, you had better retire to a restaurant and not interrupt the harmony of the courses by awkward excuses and cold acceptances. Youch. <laughs> Nothing indicates the good breeding of a gentleman so much as his manners at the table. Never hold your knife and fork upright on each side of your plate while you are talking. Never use a napkin in the place of a handkerchief by wiping the forehead or blowing the nose with it. Never, if possible, cough or sneeze at the table. A sneeze may be stifled by placing the finger firmly upon the upper lip. Never toy with your knife, fork, or spoon. Make pills of your bread or draw imaginary lines upon the tablecloth. Bread should be broken, not bitten. This is, of course, taken with the fingers. It is considered vulgar to dip a piece of bread into the preserves or gravy upon your plate and then bite it. If you desire to eat them together, it is much better to break the bread in small pieces and to convey these to your mouth with your fork. General rules regarding dinner. A guest should never find fault with the dinner or any part of it. Eat neither too fast nor too slow. Never lean back Cheese in your chair nor sit too near nor too far from the table. Every knife that can be cut with a knife should be cut with the fork alone. A lady's choice is only negative. That is to say, she may love, but she may not declare her love. She must wait. It is hers when the time comes to consent or to decline. And whatever may be said in jest or sarcasm about it, this trial of a woman's patience is often very hard to bear. A man may openly declare his passion and obtain his answer. To a gentleman seeking a partner in life, we would say, look to it that you may not be entrapped by a beautiful face. Asking Papa. No lover will assume a domineering attitude over his future wife. If he does so, she will do well to escape from his thrall before she becomes his wife in reality. A domineering lover will be certain to be still more domineering as a husband. Surprisingly progressive. Okay, I'll take that. If you cannot afford to give a ball in good style, you had better not attempt it at all. Having made up your mind to give a ball and to do justice to the occasion, the next thing to do is to decide whom and how many to invite. Any number over 100 guests constitute a large ball. Under 50 is merely a dance. As dancing is the amusement of the evening, due regard should be paid to the dancing qualifications of the proposed guests. One should be scrupulous and not wound the prejudices of a friend by sending her an invitation to a ball when it is well known she is conscientiously opposed to dancing. Vary your toilet as much as possible for fear that idlers and malignant wits, who are always a majority in the world, should amuse themselves by making your dress the description of your person. I like that. Malignant wits. 
A lady cannot refuse the invitation of a gentleman to dance unless she has already accepted that of another, for she would be guilty of an incivility which might occasion trouble. She would, moreover, seem to show contempt for whom she refused, and would expose herself to receive in secret an ill compliment from the mistress of the house. When a young lady declines dancing with a gentleman, it is her duty to give him a reason why, although some thoughtless ones do not. I sense this author hath been scorned. At the end of the dance, the gentleman reconducts the lady to her place, bows and thanks her for the honor. She also bows in silence, smiling with a gracious air. I said with a gracious air. That's better. General rules for a ballroom. A lady will not cross a ballroom unattended. Dance with grace and modesty. Refrain from great leaps and ridiculous Unmarried jumps. Ladies must be accompanied by their mother or an escort. Ladies should avoid talking too much. A gentleman will not take a vacant seat next to a lady who is a stranger it to him. It has also a bad appearance to whisper continually in the ear of your partner. First impressions are apt to be permanent. It is therefore of importance that they should be favorable. The plainest dress is always the most genteel, and a lady that dresses plainly will never be dressed unfashionably. We should order them generally to dress less. How often do we see female attired in the height of fashion, perfectly gorgeous in costume, sweeping along the dusty street, perspiring under the weight of her finery, dressed, in fact, in a manner fit only for a carriage? The most appropriate and becoming dress is that which so harmonizes with the figure as to make the apparel unobserved. Men are but indifferent judges of the material of the lady's dress. In fact, they care nothing about the matter. A modest countenance and pleasing figure, habited in an inexpensive attire, would win more attention from men than awkwardness and effrontery, clad in the richest satins and the costliest gems. Recognizing friends on the street. While walking on the street, no one should be so absent-minded as to neglect to recognize his friends. If you do not stop, you should always bow, touch your hat, or bid your friend good day. If you have anything to say to a lady whom you may happen to see in the street, however intimate you may be, do not stop her, but turn around and walk in company. Crossing a muddy street. When tripping over the pavement, a lady should gracefully raise her dress a little above her ankle. With her right hand, she should hold together the folds of her gown and draw them toward the right side. To raise the dress on both sides and with both hands is vulgar. This ungraceful practice can be tolerated only for a moment when the mud is very deep. A lady walks quietly through the streets, seeing and hearing nothing that she ought not to see and hear. She is always unobtrusive. She never talks loudly or laughs boisterously, or does anything to attract the attention of the passers-by. She simply goes about her business in her own quiet, ladylike way. So ladylike. Be she young or old, never forms an acquaintance upon the streets or seeks to attract the attention or admiration of persons. To do so would render false her claims to ladyhood if it did not make her liable to far graver charges. In walking with any person, you should keep step with military precision and with ladies and elderly people. You should always accommodate your speed to theirs. Corner loafers. No gentleman will stand in the doors of hotels, nor on the corner of the street, gazing impertinently at the ladies as they pass. That is such an unmistakable sign of a loafer. Ascending a mountain. If you are walking with a woman in the country, ascending a mountain or strolling by the bank of a river, and your companion being fatigued should choose to sit upon the ground, on no account allow yourself to do the same but remain rigorously standing. To do otherwise would be flagrantly indecorous, and she would probably resent it as the greatest insult. There are many young women who, when they sit down at the piano to sing, twist themselves into so many contortions and writhe their body and faces into such actions and grimaces as would almost incline one to believe that they are suffering great bodily torture. Their bosoms heave, their shoulders shrug, their lips quiver, their eyes roll, they sigh, they pant, they seem ready to expire. And what is this all about? They are merely playing a favorite concerto or singing a new Italian song. <laughs>
if it were possible for these conceit-intoxicated warblers, these languishing dolls, to guess what rational spectators say of their follies, they would be ready to break their instruments and be dumb forever. Let me then, in one short sentence, in one tender adieu, my fair readers and endeared friends, enforce upon your minds that if beauty be woman's weapon, it must be feathered by the graces, pointed by the eye of discretion, and shot by the hand of virtue. Don't tell me what to do. The hair should be brushed for at least 20 minutes in the morning, for 10 minutes when it is dressed in the middle of the day, and for a like period at night. The hair should be brushed carefully. The brush should be of moderate hardness, but not too hard. Many heads of hair require nothing more in the way of a wash than soap and water. Do not by any means use any dyes or advertise nostrums to preserve or change the color of the hair, or to prevent it from falling out or to curl it. They are one and all objectionable, containing more or less poison, some of them even sowing the germs of paralysis or of blindness. A person of very fair, delicate complexion should always wear the most delicate of tints. Pure golden or yellow hair needs blue. Its beauty is also increased by the addition of pearls or white flowers. Light brown hair requires blue, which sets off the advantage of golden tint. Auburn hair, if verging on red, needs scarlet to tone it down. Black hair has its color and depth enhanced by scarlet, orange, or white, and will bear diamonds, pearls, or lustreless gold. That is all I am going to share at the present moment. There is a whole lot in there that I did not address, but wow. Now, if you are like me, one thing you may have gathered is that you would not make it amongst uh, this kind of company in the 1800s. Quite honestly, it seemed exhausting. And it, you know, it's worth mentioning that this is clearly written for the white folk of the day. Um, I cannot imagine how hard any person of color must have had it, but you know, it's absolutely wild. But yes, I hope that you had fun. Really, really enjoy sort of direct research like this where it comes from an actual historical source. I tend to get a little overwhelmed and exhausted when I try to look things up on the internet um, and it's hard to tell what's true and what isn't. When you have a primary source like this, I feel like it's really, really interesting to read exactly what someone in, you know, 1888 would have been reading, researching and studying on how to be proper. <laughs> Anywho, that is it. I love you whether you're new or old to this channel. If you're new here and feel like sticking around, feel free to subscribe. I upload most Fridays and we have fun here. Oh, never mind. And I will see you in my next video. Bye. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's try that again. Bye. Why don't you have a table of contents? Women, particularly. Uh, oh. The vibe! <laughs> oh god. It's freaking windy. <sighs> Ew, I just drooled everywhere. However, ir <laughs> however irreligious. Dooby dooby doo wah wah, my name is Angela. Uh huh, this is my sh. All of the women stomp your feet like this. I am not a hollaback girl. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. You know, this was a good idea when I thought about it, but not so much anymore. I'm, uh, forget it. Yep, not doing that. My neck, I feel like it did 374 curl ups. In a dictate, dictatorial. I want to be a macho man. This is so uncomfortable. <laughs> Ew, ow, my actual mustache hairs.